Criminal Law, Mens Rea and Beyond, Political Science 203, Introduction to Law, Law and Jurisprudence Program. Well, this audio PowerPoint will guide you through probably one of the simplest areas of law, and that is criminal law. It's made more simple simply because most of it has been committed to a series of codes, like uh, civil codes that we talked about earlier. Um, we have penal codes in our state and many other states in the federal government in Canada. There's various uh, penal codes where they lay out either directly through state legislation or through the model penal code, various forms of criminal law um, um, violations and the like. Now, like with any area of law, we have essential elements of a crime. Just like with torts, intentional torts, we had the essential elements. These are the essential elements of crime. Um, basically, the elements of crime are one of culpability. Um, we find this in Anglo-American law, and it's founded on the idea that certain premises are more or less strictly observed by legislatures and courts when formulating substantive law of crimes. Thus, the prosecution is generally required to prove the following elements of a criminal offense. The first of these is the actus reus, the guilty act. To be an actus reus, it has to be a physical act or an unlawful omission to act. Remember this from torts. You can be found guilty uh, in law, in criminal law, and liable under civil law, torts, if you are legally required to act and you choose not to. So it's a physical act or unlawful omission by the defendant. That's an actus reus. The second element is mens rea, the guilty mind. This is the state of mind or intent of the defendant at the time of his crime. Now, note that I'm talking about the intent of the defendant. I'm not talking about the motive of the defendant. Remember, we touched upon this right at the beginning of the semester when we looked at the issue of Famika Kimura. What was her act? What was her mindset? What was her motive? Now, both of these items must concur. They must cross paths. An actus reus must cross paths with the mens rea. So say you plan on killing citizen B and you put off his killing until Tuesday. Well, on Monday, you're going down the street, you lose control of your vehicle and you run over citizen B. Well, that's a tort um, because you did not have the mens rea at the time of your, act, your actus reus. It was planned for Tuesday, this is Monday. So it must be concurred in the same time and place. If you look at the following, this is how I perceive the actus reus and the mens rea. They must cross paths at the same specific time and place. Mens rea, actus reus. Now, obviously, you can set like a bomb, send it in the mail. So literally, your actus reus occurs maybe days after the mens rea of wrapping up the package, but your mens rea holds. You meant to blow up a person or persons, right? So it continues to hold until the crime is completed. The actus rea is the explosion, okay? And finally, and one that's overlooked often by various um, professors is that it has to result in a harmful result. A must cause B. The mens rea the actus reus must cause harm. Obviously, to get into court, you must have harm. So harmful result is caused either factually and or proximately okay, by the defendant's act. Now, we're going to go into each of these in greater detail. The first is the actus reus, or the guilty act. Defendant must have performed a voluntary physical act or fail to act upon circumstances imposed by a legal duty to act. For this purpose, the actus reus is defined as a bodily movement. 
I could think horrible things, but unless I turn my thinking into action, it is not an actus reus. We're not talking about Vulcans here that can emanate mental harm through their thoughts. A thought is not an act. Therefore, bad thoughts alone cannot constitute a crime. Note, however, speech is an act and you're liable. So you can be criminally liable for shouting fire in a crowded movie theater. That's the age old adage, right? The idea being um, your statement causes harm. And we have this adage in law, you cannot unring the bell. Once it's out there, the harm is done. Now, the act then must be voluntary. And another way to think of it is it must be a conscious exercise of the will. A conscious exercise of the will. Since the, rational, uh, the rationality is that an involuntary act cannot be deterred by punishment. So say you have a conniption fit. I don't know what that is, but say you jerk violently and you hit somebody that causes them to take their dinner knife and slash themselves uh, grievously. Uh, weird idea. But anyway, um, putting you in jail for a conniption fit isn't going to stop you from having them. Understand? Those, in those, that type of area, we say negligence, lack of due care. Because you didn't intend it. It's a negligent. Now, there is such a thing as negligent homicide. But um, you have to have more than just merely um, a conniption fit. You have to have, you know, gone off your medication, thus causing you to have the conniption fit. Okay? Um, conduct is not the product of the uh, actor's determination. If it's a reflective or convulsive act, or an act done by the defendant when he or she is unconscious or asleep. Uh, sleep killing, I don't know if there is cases, there might be. There's sleep everything else, sleep drinking, sleep eating, sleep driving. Um, but if the defendant carries out a crime uh, without being awake, then you don't have the mens rea. You have the actus reus of the unconscious body. Now, remember, I'll emphasize this again, omission to act is an act. You could be criminally liable for omitting conduct that you must do, like not feeding your children for two months. That's criminal neglect, okay? When there's a legal duty to act, either by statute, by contract, by relationship, and also by voluntary assumption of care, like the Good Samaritan obligation, if you created the peril, you have a duty to act to remove the peril. But it must be reasonably possible for you to perform that duty or get others to help you. If you feel you can no longer care for your children, you have not committed criminal neglect if you report this condition to Child Protective Services and they come by and pick up the kids. That's the responsible thing. If you cannot act, you get people who can act, okay? So you contacting Child Protective Services is that issue of conduct, okay? So admission is an act when you have a legal duty to act. I don't want to whip the horse any further here, okay? Now, legal duties can come from various different sources, by statute, by custom, by community standards, by legislation, that all, all of those things can create a legal duty to act. But like I said before, you must be, it must be reasonably possible for you to act. Obviously, the one action, just like with tort, that you have a duty to is to inform others, to call the police, to call the ambulance, to call Child Protective Services. Right? That's within your realm of action. Okay? If you can't save that person, get somebody who can. That's a legal duty. Now, the other major factor in criminal law is mens rea, otherwise known as the guilty mind. Okay? 
the reason why we distinguish things in mens rea is it has a significance for two reasons. One, you have to distinguish between inadvertent and accidental acts and acts performed specifically with the guilty mind. You have to distinguish between acts that are inadvertent or accidental, that would be like negligent homicide, versus acts performed by one with a guilty mind, okay? Which would be first degree murder, second degree in the state of New York, we'll talk about that later, okay? The other reason why we have to make the differentiation in the guilty mind is because the penalties are far different for each category, okay? Some categories you get slapped, well, more than slapped on the wrist, you, one to five years, okay? Others, life imprisonment without the possibility of parole or capital punishment, okay? So you, we have to make a distinction in the guilty mind or of the guilty mind so that we can apply the correct uh, penalties. At the highest level, we enumerate specific intent crimes. These are crimes, I like to call it, of object and purpose. Specific intent. I mean to kill citizen B with a knife. I purchase a knife. I approach citizen B. I uh, enter the knife into citizen B's body and specific places that will bring about death. Okay? I don't go up with a knife and cut their shoulder. Well, I guess there's veins there. Cut their forearm. Right. Uh, that's not attempted murder. That's attempted um, mayhem or attempted slashing or some other uh, in, uh, injury. OK, so let's talk about another reason why we have to make distinctions. When you commit or not commit a specific intent crime, it takes certain defenses. For instance, um, you cannot commit a specific intent crime through voluntary intoxication or unreasonable mistake of fact. If you believe that by plunging the knife into citizen B, you're killing a, a huge, um, torturous, bestial pink elephant that has followed you around in your very bizarre uh, view of the world. You're highly intoxicated. You're drug addled. You cannot bring about specific intent. Okay. You will have the defense of specific intent crime. You will still not have a defense for general intent crime. That's where you bring about circumstances. Okay. So let's look at some of or enumerate some of the specific intent crimes. The first is solicitation. No, this has nothing to do with prostitution. That's a different kind of solicitation. Solicitation is the intent to have the person who solicited commit the crime. So if you contact Wally the Whacker, who's renowned for killing people, and you pay them to kill your wife, that's solicitation. I'll give the definition again. Intent to have the person solicited commit the crime. Now, this is different than attempt. Attempt is where it is the intent to commit the crime. You, instead of hiring Wally the Whacker, you go and get the knife or the gun or whatever, and you attempt to carry out the crime. Okay? And the third of these tribunderum is conspiracy. This is the intent to have the crime committed. So you either communicate with others, conspire with them um, to bring about, you know, uh, circumstances in which the person is killed or maimed or whatever. So solicitation is where you hire someone. Attempt is where you attempt yourself. And conspiracy is where you work with others to bring about that cause or that causation, that result. Okay. Now, Topping the hit list is first degree premeditated murder. Normally in many states, first degree premeditated murder is when you have the object and purpose, the object and purpose 
of bringing about the death of another. Now, in New York State and several other states, we relegate first degree, or actually we escalate first degree murder to just uh, the attempt, or excuse me, the completion of a murder against a public official, specifically police officers, uh, prison guards, judges, lawyers, and also uh, protected witnesses. You could think of that as the mafia edition, because what was happening is they would get a bunch of witnesses against the mafia hood, and before the trial concluded, the mafia hood would have uh, those individuals whacked. So any uh, member of the court or a police officer, a corrections officer, or um, a protected witness. Now, there's been attempts to also add firemen uh, to this list and rescue workers simply because uh, some idiots out there when they commit their murders, they do it in such a way to attract as much attention as possible so they can whack police officers or firemen or the like. Okay, So that's first-degree murder. Uh, in New York State, first-degree murder, like I said, is only for um, agents of the court, of, of policemen, or corrections officers. Thus, murdering Joe Blow or Josephine Blow, Citizen X, is second-degree murder in the state of New York, okay? Now, we also have assault, and look out for this one. Look out for this one. It's the reverse of tort law. Assault is the intent to commit a battery. Assault is the attempt, the intent to commit a battery, meaning this is the apprehension, right? We, it's the other way around in tort law. Assault is the intent to commit a battery. The battery is the completion of the criminal act. So if you go after someone with one of those big flashlights and you cock your arm back, ready to bludgeon them, that's assault. When you bring that large flashlight down on the victim's head, that's battery. Okay. Another one is larceny and robbery. Okay. Larceny is the intent to permanently deprive the other of his interest in the property taken. Now, there are distinctions, minor distinctions between larceny and robbery, but they're both the intent to permanently deprive the other of his interest in the property taken. Okay, so we could collectively throw those together. When you take upper level criminal law or criminal procedure, K, uh, courses, then you can make these distinctions. But for our purpose, we could roll those together. But what we can't roll together is burglary. Burglary is the intent to commit a felony in the dwelling. A felony. Now, watch out here, people. The typical felony that occurs within a dwelling is larceny or robbery. Right. But it also could be you can be found burglaring for assaulting someone in their home. OK, killing someone in their home. It basically is just defined as the intent to commit a felony in a dwelling. The typical one being either a larceny or a robbery. And the final three I want to talk to about in specific intent. Can collectively be rolled in together. Forgery. False pretenses and embezzlement. Collectively, these three criminal offenses are intent uh, to defraud. Intent to defraud. Forgery, you're defrauding the actual worth of something. False pretenses, you're uh, of defrauding the actual um, Reputation of yourself. You're uh, pretending you're a pilot. You're pretending you're a doctor. False pretenses. And embezzlement is you're defrauding the actual worth of a company. Right? This is your spreadsheet type def uh, defrauding. Where <clears throat> the company thinks they're worth a lot more 
and they're not because you're taking a lot of the profit and pocketing it, okay? Embezzlement. That's the first general common law category of crime, specific intent crime. Now, there are other categories. One that we get directly from common law are the malice crimes. Malice crimes, there's two of them, common law murder and arson. Okay, Here, it's not an action of a guilty mind. Under common law, it's a action of a malice or malformed heart. Huh? The depraved heart. Malice crimes are crimes of the depraved heart. So thus, they take no specific intent defenses of involuntary intoxication or mistake of fact. Because you're not thinking. You're feeling with your heart and causing common law murder or arson. These are layovers from common law. And I think, tongue in cheek, one of the reasons why they still exist in many jurisdictions is that it makes it easier um, to suppress individuals who commit such crimes because you don't have to go to the trouble of proving the specific intent within the mind. All you have to do is prove that their actions are abnormally uh, depraved in uh, behavior. And thus, you're proving the actions of the depraved heart. It's interesting how these holdovers from common law still play an important role today. Now, the next one is a general intent crime. Just listen to the definition and write it down. You must have awareness of the factors constituting the crime. You must be aware of the factors constituting the crime and that the result will occur. And you must be aware of any circumstances that must exist for the crime to be complete. So in other words, a general intent, you're gonna bring about the murder or, or uh, mayhem or some other crime. You're not specifically intending that person to die by means X. It could be Y or Z or A or B. So if you approach somebody spitting Ebola, I don't know where I get this, uh, Ebola uh, with a knife and a uh, dynamite stick uh, that's lit, and I don't know, think of six other ways to kill someone, and you throw all of that at your victim. Well, you don't know if they're going to die of disease, of explosion, of knife, wound, whatever. But you generally brought about the circumstances that will result in that crime. Okay. Now, another way to think about general intent crimes. Well, first of all, let's go back to the definitions. You must have awareness of all factors constituting the crime. The result will occur. And any circumstances that must exist for the crime to be completed. One other thing I must lay at this point into the lecture is to remember to separate motive from intent okay uh say you have a gentleman who steals bread from a store to feed his family that's his motive did he commit a crime the answer has to be yes he did he stole larceny uh, burglary or uh, robbery right Compare that to a person who steals bread because he gets, uh, I don't know, he gets a high off it. He loves stealing bread. He goes from store to store. He's the famous bread stealer. He's not feeding anyone. He's just stealing bread. Now, his motive is much more um, invalid, is much more heinous than someone who steals bread simply to feed his family. Did they both commit the same crime? The answer is yes. Should they be punished the same? The answer is no. So when we deal with motive, it becomes a mitigating factor for the crime. You have the same general intent crime, 
but your motives are different. One, it's valid. Eh, you're still stealing, but you're trying to feed your children. Okay. The other one, you're just nuts. You're just crazy cuckoo, want to steal bread for the thrill of it. Okay. So like with Famika Kimura, we struggled with this oh so many months ago in what was her motive and what was her intent. Okay. And this is the uh, issue. A father steals a loaf of bread from a grocery store to feed his starving children. Is it a crime? The answer must be yes. Should he be penalized like any other person committing theft? The answer is probably no. You use his motive to help mitigate his sentence. But he did commit a crime. Okay. All right. Now. The final category that I want to touch upon in the common law is the strict liability offense. A strict liability offense is one that does not require awareness of all the facts. Just what like strict liability towards the major significance of strict liability offenses is that certain defenses such as mistake of fact are not available. If you purposely put a product out in the uh, in the um, marketplace that you know is going to kill, you know it's going to kill. You don't have to ask, well, what was your intent? What was your motive? No, it's a strict liability offense. Ray seeps the locator. The facts speak for themselves, right? Like with strict liability and product liability in tort, we have strict liability offenses in uh, crime. Now, many of these strict liability offenses are created by legislation. For instance, uh, legislation um, concerning uh, statutory rape. Okay, Rape, obviously, is a specific intent crime. Strict liability offenses you will not be able to question whether, quote unquote, she dressed for it or wanted it. These horrible, horrible things that are said in rape trials. The only real question the judge will ask the victim is how old are you? And if you're under 16 in most jurisdictions or within the six year gap in most jurisdictions, then you didn't commit rape. You committed statutory rape. And that means automatically you really have no defense. We find statutory rape so bad and against a protected group, children, that the legislature has set up strict liability in this area. Another area where strict liability has been set up is in felonious murder statutes. Uh, we don't want other crimes to occur while people conspire to commit a crime. You and I agree, we're gonna rob a liquor store. We get a car, I hand a gun to you, you walk into the liquor store and you just start blowing people away. Well, what am I guilty of? Well, conspiracy, uh, probably an attempt, robbery, right? And also murder. Even though I didn't carry out one murder, it's the idea that I set the ball in motion. Um, my colleagues in crime committed those offenses. The higher offenses are rolled back into everyone's offense. So whether you're the wheel man or the gun man, right, or woman, uh, you've committed everything from your criminal, criminal enterprise. Okay, that's strict liability. RICO. Racketeering and corrupt organizations, that's strict liability. So there's many different kinds of strict liability offenses out there created by legislation. Okay. Now, before I get into the model penal code, one way to think of the common law criminal system is that if it's not specific intent, and we've enumerated those, and not strict liability, and we've kind of let those out, or a malice crime, then it has to be general intent. 
General intent crime tends to be the bushel basket. When you can't fit something clearly in any one of the categories, okay, it's normally a, a general intent crime. I hope that helps. I don't know. Now, we've got some confusion here. A lot of these standards are very ambiguous, you would agree, from the common law, especially between general intent and specific intent. So various lawyers groups from various states work together to create a, the model penal code. And basically the model penal code is not only in New York, but it's in most jurisdictions in the United States. Matter of fact, I could hazard a guess it's in all jurisdictions, one form or another of the model penal code. What the model penal code seeks to do is to not look at the culpability like common law does, but looks at the mental component of the criminal offense. In other words, the element of fault, okay? The element of fault, the mental component. And again, we have categories under the model penal code. The first of these are the collective known as purposely, knowingly, recklessly. Purposely, otherwise known as intentionally, knowingly, recklessly and this relates exactly to what's going on in the defendant's mind purposely it's the defendant's conscious objective it's delta's conscious objective i seek to kill citizen b with a knife i buy a knife i care i approach citizen b i plunge knife into areas that will bring about his or her death that is purposely okay the second category, defendant is aware that the conduct is of the nature to bring about the criminal uh, action. So knowingly is you're aware generally of the conditions and that your conduct will bring about or is of the nature of uh, bringing about that uh, result, that criminal result. Recklessly is when the defendant consciously note this consciously disregards a substantial or unjustifiable risk and it's a gross deviation from the standard of care notice standard of care where did we hear this before negligent tort right but this is gross negligence gross deviation from the standard of care and this could be distinguished from the second general category negligent crime this is where defendant fails to be aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk fails to be aware doesn't consciously disregard but fails to be aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk in this case it's not a gross deviation it's but it is a substantial deviation from the standard of care the standard of care of who the reasonable person Again, we bring back some tort concepts, the reasonable person, a substantial deviation from the standard of care of the reasonable person. Now, the model penal code also includes a couple interesting, um, these are pretty straightforward, but a couple interesting ones. The third general model penal code category is the vicarious liability. This is the concept of respondeat superior. This is where you act through another to bring about the actus reus. Okay, and again, we borrow this from tort law, respondeat superior. It means that I have the criminal mens rea. I wanna blow up those soldiers over there. So I get a kid, pack his backpack with C4 or dynamite or something, uh, with the time fuse, I tell the boy to go over and play with those soldiers. Soldiers die. Well, you can't say the kid who's unaware, we call that a dupe. Yes, in law, we call that person a dupe or a, um, an incompetent person, right? He committed the actus reus, but it was because of my mens rea. My mens rea acted through the child uh, to commit the actus reus. 
Is there a concurrence? Yes. You hold out the mens rea until the action's completed. And if it's the conscious goal of my mens rea to cause that actus reus, boom, I've committed the crime. You can't find that the child, who's probably gone anyway, has committed a crime. He was a dupe. He did not know, right, that um, he was carrying out your hate-filled actions, okay? And the final is enterprise liability. No, it has nothing to do with Star Trek. Enterprise liability is the liability of corporations and associations. At common law, corporations could not be found guilty because of, and here's your big word for today, the anthropomorphic fallacy. Corporations do not think. You cannot say they have a brain, a brain. They act, but common law had a hard time figuring out how they thought. Well, the model penal code makes this easy. We add enterprise liability. So if a corporation, limited partnership, or association wants to do a crime, anyone who's made that decision, whether it's the CEO, the CFO, the board of trustees, whoever, their mental state is connected to then the actus reus of the corporation, company, limited partnership. So the actus reus is anyone in the decision-making realm who understood what was going on. They've emanated their mens rea. The company, corporation, or limited partnership has carried out the actus reus. We have concurrence. We have a crime. And that's called enterprise liability. So model penal code sought to clarify many of the common law problems in definition. I, <laughs> the model penal code also gives us, I think, some additional problems, but it's a little bit clearer than the common law. Now the next thing I want to look about, look out, look at is something very simple, accomplice liability. And there's many more than the four that I'm going to offer you, but these four kind of cover the biggies. The first is principle in the first degree, known as P1. P1 is a person with the requisite mental state who actually engages in the actions or a mission to act that causes the criminal result. It's the person with the requisite mental state who actually engages in the act or admission to act that causes the criminal result. I want to kill citizen B. I get a knife. I plunge the knife into uh, important parts of citizen B that brings about his death. I'm the principal in the first degree. Principle in the second degree, or P2, is one who aids, counsels, commands, or encourages P1, and here's the important part, and is present at the time of the crime. I walk up with another uh, criminal. I hand him the knife. He plunges it into citizen B. Okay? Okay. So what am I? I'm a principal in the second degree. I have aided the principal in the first degree. He's the one that plunges the knife into the victim. So a principal in the second degree is one who aids, counsels, commands, or encourages P1 in the commission of the crime, and the important part, and is present at the time of the crime. The reason why we have to make that distinction is because the third type, oh, I'm sorry, before we go on, this is the typical, you've heard this, aiding and abetting, aiding and abetting a criminal, okay? That's uh, uh, P2, principal in the second degree. Now, the reason why we have to distinguish about whether they're present at the time of the crime is because of accessory before the fact. An accessory before the fact is one who aids abets, procures, or commands the commission of the crime, but is not present at the scene of the crime. 
Okay. Now, the scene of the crime is an interesting concept. If you and I decide to roll a liquor store, we get into my car, I drive to the liquor store, I park out front, you go in, steal, and kill in the liquor store, am I at the scene of the crime? And the courts will say yes. You know, the scene of the crime is kind of a nebulous concept. How far away is not at the scene of the crime becomes the question, okay? But it doesn't matter in one regard. You could be an accessory before the fact. You aid a bed procurer. You set forth a person out to their scene of the crime where you're not at, and they commit the crime. You're an accessory before the fact. Obviously, our final of the four biggies is accessory after the fact. This is one who receives, relieves, comforts, or assists in another knowing that he has committed a felony in order to assist a felon escape arrest, trial, or conviction. Okay? After the fact, after they committed the crime, and they have to know that that person committed a felony. Enter the infamous Dr. Mud. Uh, from whence we get the term, your name is Mud. Dr. Mud um, was the person who uh, received uh, Wilkes Booth after he had killed President Lincoln. The question becomes, did he know that uh, John Wilkes Booth, did he know that John Wilkes Booth had committed a felony? Well, he did have a gunshot, okay? Uh, but that wasn't unknown back in the day, okay? Uh, they hunted, whatever, whatever. Um, he should have known, but he didn't know. And it wasn't in Washington. It was one of the smaller towns outside of Washington, okay? But Dr. Mudd um, was basically convicted, and in the public press, his family was basically thrown in the mud. Uh, thus the term, your name is Mud. Years later, I think it was like 1980, Harvard Law School retried Dr. Mudd and found him not guilty. From the evidence that was given, he, it could be argued that he did not know that John Wilkes Booth had just killed Lincoln. Okay. Um one of the other major topics, and this, I apologize to CJ majors, because I'm only going to give you, what is it, six theories of punishment. There's literally 60,000 uh, theories of punishment. These are the major ones. These are the ones, um, and the rest are permutations or combinations in one form or another. The first theory of punishment is incapacitation. The idea being, while in prison, that criminal has fewer opportunities to commit acts causing harm to society. You've incapacitated that criminal. You've restrained that criminal. The problem is, you know, there's still other prisoners and guards and nursing staff that could be uh, affected by that criminal. That's why we have first degree premeditated murder and things like that uh, because it protects prison guards and the like, okay? But incapacitation is the argument that while in prison, a criminal has fewer opportunities to commit acts causing harm to society. The second general theory is special deterrence. And this is where you argue that punishment meted out to that criminal will deter that criminal from committing future crimes. Right. Once bitten, twice shy, that once they have committed a criminal act and faced uh, incarceration, they are less likely to ever commit a crime. Well, we know problems with this. A lot of times prisons can be seen as like criminal boces where you go in a petty criminal and you come out quite a good criminal because you learn from the other criminals in prison. Now. The third theory is general deterrence. This is the idea that punishment itself deters other would-be criminals from committing similar crimes. 
for fear of incurring the same punishment. You're about to roll a bank for your first time. You noticed on whatever television or whatever you've heard through the grapevine that Bugsy Malone has committed a, a bank robbery and is now serving 25 years in a federal penitentiary, right? That might stop you. That idea might deter you from committing a similar crime. One of my favorite and society's favorite and politicians favorite is retribution. Punishment is meted out to impose or vent society's out sense of outrage and need for revenge. And you have politicians basically trying to outdo each other, you know, uh, death penalty. Oh, well, there's there's too many delays. Uh, thus only give them three appeals. Limit that, you know. Um, they try to outdo each other by looking butch and vengeful because punishment very strongly in, a, in the American mental state is part and parcel of retribution. You want to get even with criminals. Okay. Now let's go back to the 70s. Rehabilitation. And let's hold hands. Imprisonment, just listen to it and you can meet out whatever you want. Imprisonment provides the opportunity to mold or reform the criminal to a person who upon return to society would conform his or her behavior to societal norms. In this view, um, you go to prison to become a better citizen. <laughs> anyway, that was very dominant in 1970s and 1980s. Uh, less so now than it was in the past. But there's still people out there that are saying our prisons need to reform. Otherwise, you have recidivism. Uh, you've always heard this term. What is recidivism? It's the likelihood that you will recommit a similar crime. Recidivism. Um, some of the highest recidivism rates stand at about 95% for um, pedophiles. It's one of the highest. Other recidivism rates, like burglary and stuff, is down at 70%. Okay, um, And it goes counter to the idea of what prison does. If you truly reform the criminal, well, you have a rehabilitative uh, prison experience. But if you don't, uh, and it's BOCES for criminals, then you're taking a minor criminal... Uh, they're conforming their behavior to the other badasses that they see in prison alongside them. And they come out of jail a worse criminal. Hardcore. Okay. And the final theory I want to touch upon is education theory. This is the idea that the publicity attached to seeing trials, convictions, and punishment, like on what used to be called court TV, now it's true TV, right? And other channels and the like, all these shows, the idea is to educate the public. The media, media access to courts play a critical role in distinguishing good and bad behavior and developing a respect for the law. Okay. Obviously, when we have police brutality or racial issues in policing, that works counter to educating our society, or maybe it does. It educates society to reality, perhaps. Okay, But you see that the educative quality of exposing our legal system to the light of day would stop at a very early age, hopefully, a person from contemplating criminal behavior. Okay, So court TV and the like always make this argument. They always want to open up the courts to media exposure. Now, the last thing I want to touch upon in this lecture series is classifications of crimes, okay? At common law, crimes were divided into three classes, treason, felonies, and misdemeanors. Treason is where you work against your country. You spy on them. You give aid and comfort to the enemy. That's treason. 
Uh, punishable by death. It's still the only clear federal death penalty. It's treason. Eh? Felonies and misdemeanors are the first classification distinction. Felonies are punishable by death or imprisonment exceeding one year. Death or uh, imprisonment exceeding one year. Misdemeanors are punishable by fines, you know, monetary fines, or imprisonment for less than one year. So the one-year cutoff is key. Above one year, it's a felony. Below one year, it's a misdemeanor. At common law, just listen to the felonies that were listed. Murder, duh. Manslaughter, rape. Sodomy, my favorite, mayhem. <laughs> it's like a wilding. You go wild. Okay. Robbery, larceny, arson, and burglary. At common law, all of the crimes were considered misdemeanors. So you have murder, manslaughter, rape, sodomy, mayhem, robbery, larceny, arson, and burglary. And all other crimes were considered misdemeanors. The second major distinction in classifications of crime, and your Latin for today, are malum in se crimes and malum prohibitum crimes. A malum in se crime is, and look at the word malum. In this context, it means wrong. A malum in se is a wrong in and of itself. Murder is malum and say. Rape is malum and say. Okay? It's wrong in and of itself. It's inherently evil. Okay? And malum and say normally involves crimes of moral turpitude. Crimes of moral turpitude. Moral turpitude is an offense against society. It makes society sick. You're a sick criminal. If you've committed a crime of moral turpitude, raping a child, okay, uh, bestiality is crimes of moral turpitude. Now, malum prohibitum crimes are crimes that are crimes because the legislature has made them crimes, like tax evasion is a malum prohibitum. Obviously, you didn't have the crime of tax evasion until you had a universal tax system in this country. And just ask uh, Willie Nelson, not paying your taxes is a, a malum prohibitum. Notice something too, malum prohibitums can enhance malum and say crimes. Rape is malum and say. Statutory rape is malum prohibitum. So malum and say is the rape, malum prohibitum is the addition and typically additional additional penalties for committing rape against a youth, okay? Uh, murder is malum and say. Felonious murder is malum prohibitum. It's what happens, like the worst crime uh, is then disseminated among those parties to the crime. I'm just a wheel man. My colleague is the one that killed. I am convicted of killing as well. Malum prohibitum, felonious murder statutes. Okay? And you know that a lecture series is not over until you have the rotating icon. I hope this helped. Um, I will be posting practice quizzes on criminal law to make sure that uh, you're one with this. So have a great day.